Hello and welcome to another DW Business Special. Once again, we're talking about Russia continuing to put the squeeze on gas supply and the European response to that. This week, Russia's state energy supplier Gazprom slashed gas supply yet again to Germany through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Germany's network operator says flows have now sunk to just 20% of normal levels. That means it'll be difficult for the country to fill its reserve before the weather gets cold in Germany. And any further reductions could trigger emergency gas rationing. Joining me now in our little studio to discuss this is my colleague Aaron Tilton. Hi, Aaron. And on the line, we have Leon Izbiki, a natural gas analyst at Energy Aspects. Leon, starting with you, looking at the state of Europe's reserves, how much of a blow is this latest cut? It's it's still quite significant. We're talking about, uh, as you mentioned before, a cut to only 20% of capacity via Nord Stream 1. And if that continues over, for example, the rest of the injection period and also throughout winter, we are looking even tighter on the European balance in a situation in which there might be an incentive for European governments to actually trigger the mandatory cuts for, uh, for rationing programs. Definitely not an ideal situation there. But Aaron, so turning to you, you've covered Russia for quite a while. How likely is it that Russia will cut off supply completely? I mean, it'll hurt Europe for sure, but then they can't use that as a bargaining chip anymore. Sure, and I I think to a certain extent it really depends on how um, Europe and specifically Germany reacts to this threat and to this cut. Because you have to realize, uh, despite what the Kremlin claims, it's kind of dubious whether or not there are actually technical reasons behind this cut. It does appear that Vladimir Putin and the circle of people around him in the Kremlin are trying to put pressure both on the EU and the and also more specifically on Germany. Germany has, since the Ukraine crisis started, been um, a rather, well, they've held back some of their support from Ukraine, which is they've often been criticized by Kiev for. And really, I do think that this is kind of a balancing act for Russia. They're trying to figure out, um, trying to see how Germany and how the EU will react to see if whether or not um, they should actually care about the threat of, uh, well, cutting off gas supplies more broadly. I mean, uh, you have to remember, Vladimir Putin doesn't necessarily have a really long-term plan. He comes from that intelligence community, and they very much like to just kind of give their opponents a little bit of a shove, see how they can off-balance them a bit and then decide whether or not they should move forward. So I think the prospects of a complete gas off, uh, gas cutoff is going to be determined by just how the politicians and how the public here react. I suspect this isn't going to be the first time in the show where I'm going to be asking you to look into the state of mind of the Kremlin. But now focusing on Germany in particular, there's been a noticeable attempt to try and prepare the populace for a very cold and very expensive winter. Here's Germany's economist, economy minister, Robert Habeck. Gazprom is proving to be an unreliable supplier. But the gas volumes have been promised to others, and that means they still need to be sourced at significantly higher market prices. And this difference is the surcharge. It will be passed on to consumers because otherwise the companies would face permanent losses of many millions of euros every week, and that would eventually put them out of business. Ultimately, we don't know exactly how high the costs will be in November or December, but the bitter news is it will certainly be several hundred euros per household. So that was Germany's economy minister, Robert Habeck. Leon, back to you. Do you have a sense of how prepared Germany and the rest of Europe is for prices growing as supply shrinks? Well, I mean, what we can see in Germany in particular is, as uh, Robert Harbeck mentioned, the preparation of the levy in order to try and prevent systematic shocks to uh, German and European stability, uh, utilities, essentially, as they need to source spot volumes to make up for the, the missing volumes from Russia. But what we are seeing more, more specifically is that this is also an attempt to actually further reduce demand among the European population simply by increasing the overall price burden for end consumers. So if we are looking at more reductions from the residential and commercial sector, this would actually further help alleviate the tightness in European gas markets that, that we're seeing at the moment. And I think the second component is more generally speaking, how prepared European governments are at the moment uh, to, to actually implement rationing programs. And I think this is still very much a state of flux 
we heard repeatedly from the Bundesnetzagentur in Germany that they are still in the process of setting up their portal to monitor daily consumption from large-scale industrials, which is really needed in order to actually implement rationing programs. And more generally speaking, the current programs that are in place focus on a very short temporary suspension of flows, for example, into Germany, whereas we are here now talking about a prolonged supply disruption from Russia. So that will still probably take some time until policymakers really are able to adequately respond to these long-term potential supply disruptions. So policymakers really should be looking at a more long-term horizon. Aaron, I am going to ask you to look at the Russian side yet again. So we're looking at a world where Russia is set to permanently lose Europe as a gas customer. Can it afford to do that? I mean, we can hardly assume that its Asian trading partners can pick up the shortfall there. Well, that's actually a really good point. I mean, we have seen in the last several years, the last eight or nine years, a uh, continuing pivot from Moscow towards its Asian partners. You know, they've been courting India and China for a long period of time right now. But when it comes to their energy infrastructure, they don't have the inf same infrastructure in place that they do with Europe. I think part of the problem we're seeing right now is it really does seem like the Kremlin was expecting the conflict in Ukraine to be a rather short affair. They were expecting to take uh, Kiev within five or six days, and that didn't happen. They really massively underestimated the resolve of both the Ukrainians and also the international community when it comes to supporting them. So what we're seeing right now, I think, is them being a little bit kind of pushed into a corner. They're having to, you know, bring out larger and larger uh, weapons, in a sense, uh, um, to actually put Europe under pressure and continue that uh, to mount that pressure campaign against Ukraine as well. So I don't think they're really willing uh, or able to lose Europe long term. The problem is they're involved in a very long conflict that they weren't initially expecting to be involved in. Leon, is that an assessment that you agree with? I think what Aaron mentioned is, is correct in the sense that we are looking at the fact that the main bulk of Russia's gas fields is really connected only into uh, or majorly into the European market. So when we are looking at the potential uh, ramifications of a full flow hold, for example, we are in a situation in which Russia cannot divert those flows from Europe into other countries. We're looking at, uh, for example, flows into China actually coming from fields in Russia's Far East, which are not connected to the, to the rest of the grid. And the main pipeline that would connect those fields in Western Siberia into the Chinese market, that is not expected to come online until 2027 or 2028. So there are significant economic ramifications for Russia if it were to decide to pursue the avenue of a full flow hold. But I think what is also important to mention and to stress in this case is that there is a risk of Russia not uh, uh, really following an economic rationale anymore. It, uh, it has defied assumptions of rationality with the invasion of Ukraine. It has also demonstrated its willingness to breach contracts with European suppliers. So if political considerations in terms of actually aiming for a maximization of harm that can inflict on, on Europe before Europe weans itself of Russian gas by taking more LNG, for example, in the US in 2026, 2027, if that dominates Russian thinking, then there is a significant risk of a full flow halt over the course of this winter and potentially next year. And uh, if I may interject, and that's a point I definitely agree with. It has seemed from the get-go that this conflict is very much, um, when it comes to the Kremlin rationale, about Vladimir Putin's legacy. It does appear that he wants to be um, a president and a leader of Russia that goes in the history books as, in, from their view, you know, preventing a further expansion of NATO. And also at the exact time, he wants to, just like Peter the Great or Catherine the Great, be um, a Russian leader who changes the borders of Russia. It really seems like more than anything, as he He's, you know, seeing his uh, career advance more and more. He wants to, he's concerned about how the history books are going to view him and his legacy as well. And I do think that's feeling, feeling a lot of the rationale behind this invasion of Ukraine. That, I guess, is his grand design and the economic implications or the economic consequences out of that is something that he is considering less. Now, turning back to us here in Europe, obviously, Germany and Eastern Europe are much more exposed to Russian gas supply cuts than, say, Spain or Portugal. But this week, European Union countries altogether agreed to cut back on gas consumption by 15%. Uh, from August to March. But this deal is a much weaker version of an original proposal put forward by the European Commission, sparking concerns over the potency of these commitments. 
Our correspondent Christine Munwa followed these proceedings in Brussels, and here's what she had to say about those concerns over effectiveness. The Commission insists uh, this plan will be effective even if all of these derogations or these exemptions are exercised uh, at any given point. Uh, and you're quite right, it has been watered down significantly. And at any stage in the game, virtually every single member state could, could claim an exemption uh, at, at a given point. Uh, but the Commission is confident that even in the case that that were to happen, that this plan would still be effective to get Europe through uh, what it is saying would be an average winter. Leon, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but do you see that deal resulting in significant gas savings for the bloc? I think it's it's important to distinguish between the voluntary uh, reductions that the EU Council aims for and then the potential to implement the mandatory reductions. I think on a voluntary basis, um, I'm a bit pessimistic about actually being able to reach a 15% cut in consumption across Europe. And the main reason for this is that it's quite uncertain at this stage what exactly policymakers are going to offer to uh, the, the, the gas market overall, to consumers essentially, um, in order to turn down consumption of gas that the market itself, in terms of prices, isn't already doing. We are looking at prices around 200 euros a megawatt hour for the TTF. So that is uh, essentially maximizing the switch from gas to coal in the power sector. We are also looking at prices this side that are actually incentivizing industrials to turn down production and to actually sell gas volumes back into the market. And it is also weighing on end consumers for private households that are looking probably at turning down their domestic consumption over the course of winter. But all of that is already baked into the current price. And we have already seen policy initiatives in particular from Germany, where we have brought back idled coal and lignite fired capacity as well as oil fired capacity to the market. So what exactly happens with to, to reach that voluntary 15% demand cut is actually quite uncertain and it looks not really realistic. The more important thing here is really the ability for the Commission to impose a mandatory demand cut in case of a union-wide emergency, which will help Europe to actually uh, uh, get through a situation such as a full flow halt over the course of winter in a weather normal scenario. But then again, the question becomes, how exactly is the Commission and how exactly are European member states going to um, uh, coordinate on, on prolonged rationing across the entirety potentially over the next two, three or four years until we can actually replace Russian gas and the European gas balance from supplies from elsewhere? Okay, so until the European Union is able to do that, then it might be more useful to think of this agreement as a political signal. But Aaron, how do you think the Kremlin views such a show of solidarity or the solidarity that they want us to see from the EU? Well, to a certain extent, I think the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin kind of underestimated the resolve both of the European Union, uh, member states of the European Union, and also the United States when it comes to supporting Ukraine. And as I was saying earlier, I don't think there was necessarily as well developed of a long-term strategy from the side of the Kremlin. You have to remember this is a this is a, um, a government and a leader who spent millions and millions of um, euros investing on investing in uh, trying to actually create derision. Um, within the European Union. That's why we have seen the Kremlin and other groups in Russia supporting far-right parties here in Germany, uh, in the United States, actually throughout um, the Europe in general. And they've invested a lot of money in just trying to sow mistrust. When it comes to the um, the conflict in Ukraine, why I think they kind of underestimated um, what was going on is, you know, ostensibly they didn't want NATO um, to actually get a foothold in Ukraine, which is part of the reason they started this conflict. At the same time, what they've seen, what I guess they probably didn't necessarily expect at the beginning, is states like Finland then saying that they were going to join the bloc. Um, I really do think that the invasion of Ukraine was a very short-sighted and maybe uh, well, thought, uh, no, very poorly thought out move on the part of um, Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin. And so I don't necessarily think that they were prepared for this level of solidarity within the European Union. Well, it is important, of course, that uh, this solidarity holds. And it's all very well to be able to reduce demand together. But many experts have argued for a way to secure supply. So European countries are now focusing on using their energy 
energy resources at their disposal, but no one really thinks that's a long-term solution. So experts from think tanks such as Bruegel have argued for a grand bargain of sorts, where member states pool their energy resources no matter what the source or where that energy com comes from. So that would mean that coal and nuclear are accepted for now, even in countries where they are unpopular. While Europe builds up its green energy infrastructure at a much faster pace. Leon, turning to you, what do you think of this idea of a grand bargain? Well, I think it's it's definitely s symptomatic of the uh, divergence between short to medium term goals and, and long term goals. In the short to medium term, it is about guaranteeing energy security and policymakers have been willing to actually take a step back in terms of uh, overall goals and emissions reductions, for example, in order to achieve and meet that goal by bringing back coal fired power plants, lignite fired power plants, and even oil fired power plants that were previously idled. And in the long term, what the current situation with Ukraine does is that it actually accelerates the transition towards renewable renewable energies simply because they are perceived to put Europe in less of a bind on and less of a dependence on fossil fuel imports from other countries. Aaron, you were talking earlier about how much the Kremlin underestimated the level of solidarity that is present among the European countries. Is Moscow going to make that same mistake? Is Moscow betting on Europe getting together for such a grand bargain? Do they think they'll be able to pull that off cooperatively? Well, I, I don't necessarily have a crystal ball, but if I were um, a betting man, I'd say I don't think they actually think that uh, Europe will long-term be able to wean themselves off um, uh, Russian gas entirely. At the end of the day, I mean, the status quo in Russia for such a long period of time is that they were trading with the European Union as their main trading partner when it, when it came to energy, that um, I think they think when the conflict ends that we will see a return to the status quo. I mean, most of the Russian government is is, oh, 60 percent of the Russian government is rather funded by sales of gas and uh, oil to the European Union. So I think in their view, this is a little bit of uh, economic and energy based brinkmanship. And they think that when, you know, as it starts to get colder, as gas starts to get more expensive and as um, support for the war in Ukraine starts to wane, that they'll be able to return back to business as usual. Now, of course, um, I do think from the view of the European Union, though, that this is a real sea change. And um, I don't think think the Kremlin is really prepared for the long-term ramifications of that. Now, we have to go in just a second, but I wanted to ask you guys any last words. Leon, any last point that you would like to make before we leave our viewers? I think the, the main question for policymakers in particular when it comes to considering this idea of a grand bargain is that they have to be prepared to actually implement uh, relatively potentially unpopular policies domestically, as, as you've mentioned. But one of the main questions um, that remains unresolved at this stage, for example, in addition to uh, you know the obvious uh, potential delay in the nuclear phase out in Germany, is the uh, Groningen gas field and whether there is a potential to ramp up production from Groningen, simply because this could actually help alleviate quite substantially some of the tightness on European markets and help reduce further the dependence for Europe on Russian gas. But what the main takeaway of all of this is, is that actually in the immediate short to medium term, uh, Europe still needs the marginal Russian gas molecule to actually balance to meet demand. So the only way to actually cope uh, in, in, the, in the short to medium term with a potential further disruption in supplies from Russia or even a halt in flows altogether is just demand rationing and active demand side management. So for, for policymakers and for the electorate, it becomes a question of whether uh, they are willing to, to, as I said, sacrifice in the short to medium term ambitions regarding uh, a potential pivot towards renewables for an actual alleviation of the overall inflationary and price burden on end consumers and on the European economy as a whole. I really do think that's a great point. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're seeing here is that the European Union really, and those politicians, are really going to have to kind of bite the bullet and be willing to have the resolve to push through policies which are not going to be very popular among their electorate. I mean, we're seeing gas and heating prices here in Germany spiral out of control. I mean, I just moved to a new apartment and suddenly I'm paying literally eight times more to heat my apartment than I was a year ago at this time. And I think that's really what the Kremlin wants to do. They're kind of hoping that 
that by putting economic pressure of this sort on um, the electorate that they can actually kind of put pressure on Berlin and the other capitals in um, Europe to move away from their support of Ukraine. And, you know, if the European Union really wants to make sure that um, we don't return to a situation um, where, you know, a, a rogue state can change the borders of another country by military force, they're going to have to have um, all the chutzpah to just force through policies that their electorate isn't really going to want to support necessarily. But uh, that's exactly what the Kremlin's challenge uh, to the European Union right now is trying to do. Fascinating stuff. We can talk about this all day, but unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here for now. That's all we have for you for this week from our little business desk. We'll be back here with another DW Business Special for you next week. Thanks a lot to my guests, Leon Izbiki and Aaron Tilton. If you'd like more, please hit the like and subscribe button. I'd also encourage you to check out the DW Business Series here on YouTube, Business Beyond, which takes a look at business phenomena shaping the globe. For me and the whole business team in Berlin, thanks for watching.